want to go on to talking about um, optimal transport in the context of some different uh, flow problems. Uh, so today I want to talk about, or at least start talking about, uh, what's called the Benning and Bernier formulation, where you take the optimal transportation problem and reinterpret it uh, as essentially like a fluid flow type problem, or flowing one density into another in some kind of optimal way. Okay, so this is Benjamin Brenier. <coughs> okay, so this will be the idea. Um, as usual, we've got our source density F, we've got our target density G, okay, uh, which we're going to assume have bounded support. And now I'm going to consider a time-dependent density that tries to flow between them. Okay, so let's consider a density like this. We'll call rho, which now depends on both time and space. Okay, so space in Rn, and we're going to assume again that these have bounded support. And we'll let time go from 0 to 1. <coughs> and what we want is that at time zero, we recover the density F, our source, and at time one, it somehow evolves into our target density. Okay, we're going to introduce a velocity field and let this flow through a velocity field V. So if we introduce this, okay, which also may be time and space dependent. And we want this to flow in a way that preserves mass. OK, and we can do this via uh, our usual continuity equation. So we're going to describe a mass-preserving flow this way. OK, via continuity equation. Okay, so what do we have? We have rho t plus the divergence of v rho is equal to zero. <coughs> now uh, we can follow a particle along in this flow. Uh, so we could introduce Lagrangian cardi coordinates to help us follow a particle. So uh, let's do that. We have Lagrangian coordinates that we'll call capital X. Okay, to follow the flow. Okay, so what does capital X represent? Capital X represents the position of a particle that was initially at position X and, and now has moved, and now we want to know where it is at time t. Okay, so this is going to evolve along with our velocity field. <coughs> okay, so the particle moves according to the velocity, so that, which is going to depend on time and its position at that time, and its position at that time is given by capital X. <coughs> okay, and again, initially, it's going to be at position little x. <coughs> right, so if we put our axis here of space and time, this is x, particle will move, and this would be the location capital X at time 1. Right, so we can follow a particle, or we could also follow a, a batch of particles. So instead of just trying to follow one particle, we might do this. Let's try to 
take everything that lives between here and here, let's call this set E, and see where these particles end up. Okay, well they may evolve differently. Uh, but now we can uh, define these sets. So this set, for example, in here, is going to be the set capital X at time T and set E. So it's the position at time T of all the particles that started in the set E. Uh, and eventually, obviously, we get up to this set here, which is going to be the position at time 1 of everything. Okay, what do we know? We know that this flow conserves mass. All right, we've, we've defined it in a way that it has to do that. Uh, so we can certainly say that the mass in set E at time zero, right? Whatever is in here, however much mass is in here, is going to be the same as however much mass is in here at a later time. The same as however much mass is in here at a later time. This is the same as the amount of mass in the set X, capital X of TE, at time T. Is that reasonable? Okay, so how can I write that? The amount of mass in here, well, I have a density. The amount of mass in here is equal to my initial density, which we said was F. The amount of mass in here is I just integrate my density over the set. Uh, and similarly, I could integrate my density, my new density, over the set at a later time. So at a later time, my density is given by rho. And I integrate it over this set, capital X. Okay, and this should be true for any t between 0 and 1. <coughs> oh, so this, this statement should look familiar. Right, we've seen this equality before this semester. It looks like a push forward. Yeah. This is our usual, you know, conservation of mass, conservation of measure condition. In other words, this object right here actually represents a map. Right? And it's a map that preserves mass. So indeed this is the statement that we can take capital X at a fixed time, and it's a function of space, and it pushes forward our original density f into our new density rho at time t. <coughs> and if we happen to do it at t equals 1, right, capital X at t equals 1 pushes forward f into rho at t equals 1. And if we've set up the flow code correctly, that's our target density. OK, so if we can set up a flow that does this, right, then we can, uh, we can create a map that's at least feasible for the optimal transport problem. Now, the real goal is to say, can we come up with a way of flowing this? with the choice of V that will make this um, not just feasible, but optimal. Okay, and that's really the goal of this benham brenny formulation, is to use this fluid flow formulation and to try to come up with this combination of, of rho and V such that we actually produce an optimal map.
Um, you don't need, you actually don't need too much regularity for the map itself. Um, you certainly, you certainly need bounded support on your densities. Uh, this, so this formulation is actually nice. Um, it's very flexible and it, it can, uh, there's some disadvantages to this, to the kind of numerical method you'd get out of this, and we'll talk about that later. Um, but it has the advantage of being very flexible and robust. So in particular, uh, you wouldn't necessarily need to assume that you have convex target set, which, which you would need to do if you're trying to solve a Mosin pair equation uh, in the viscosity formula. That's the cost of being you get a more expensive numerical method. But you, there's always a cost. So we can certainly make a connection to the optimal transport cost. Um, this, is a, this is a feasible map, which means uh, it's going to overestimate the optimal transport cost if I put it in there, right? Either equal to or greater than the optimal transport cost if I plug this in. So we make this connection. We can write it in terms of of W2 squared, we'll do this for quadratic cost, not equal, but less than or equal to what we get if I plug in this map. Okay, so I wait by my density, this is my d mu, and then I look at capital X of one X minus little x squared, right? If this was the optimal map, we'd exactly get our W2 squared. Um, this is a feasible map, so we know it's going to overestimate W2 squared. All right, and now we want to rearrange this a little bit and try to put this in terms of, of things that show up in this kind of flow problem. So little x, a little x I can represent as capital X at time zero. So that's an easy change. Now here I've got the difference between capital X at the final and initial time. Uh, uh, that's something you've seen before uh, way back in first year calculus. Right. We do a little fundamental theorem of calculus and I can relate that to an integral. Uh, and it's a relevant integral because um, we're going to be integrating this, this is something that is actually relevant to this problem. Okay, so I can write this as this.
Uh, so I'm just going to zoom in on the inner integral a little bit here. So let's fix P. What we can do with this inner integral to start with. Uh, so since I'm fixing T, let's see. This, this guy here, this is a map. For fixed T, this is a map. So um, since I'm not worrying about T right now, let's just simplify the language and define it as a function of X. <clears throat> okay, and again, this is a map. Let me know what its push forward is. Its push forward is rho at the particular time I'm interested in. Okay, and then again, I have this thing that I'm integrating. Which, okay, I'm not so concerned about t right now because I'm just trying to do this integral over x to start with. Uh, so let's just simplify the language a little bit. I'm phi y equal v of t y squared, which is essentially the thing that we're integrating. <coughs> okay, so what is our inner integral? Our inner integral is started out like this f of x v of t, capital X. Okay, and now I can just simplify, simplify the notation a little bit just so that we can try to figure out what's going on. So this is my function v. It's being evaluated at capital X, and capital X is this map. So this is really phi of s of x. Okay, so if I'm going to try to get this in terms of my time-dependent flow, uh, what, what other piece of information am I going to use here? So how am I going to change this from F into a row? I have to push forward, exactly. So F and row are related like this, and they're related through this S, right? So I can do a change of variables here. I can say this is the same as integrating rho against phi of y. Now, if we're gonna, if we're gonna put it back inside this integral, uh, let's replace phi with what it actually is. Phi was actually v, um, and now happily we don't have this complicated argument inside of inside of it. We just have y. Something simple. So this is now going to be rho of t y times v t y squared d y. Right? And it's all in terms of, of objects that we're trying to flow, this row that we're flowing through this velocity field B. Okay, so I'm just, I'm just going to put it in that expression there, that inequality that I had before uh, the bottom strength squared. <clears throat> right, so W2 squared at G is now less than or equal to And now on my integrand, I've simplified quite a bit. And now it's just rho tx, v of tx squared, dx dt. <coughs> and this 
this inequality is going to hold for a variety of choices of rho and a variety of choices of v. This holds for every rho and v that satisfy our flow problem. So they have to satisfy the continuity equation. That's what gave us this mass preserving map. And they have to have the correct initial and final densities. Uh, that's what gives us feasibility. Any questions there so far? Oh, when do we acquire the Jacobian? When do we do the change of variables? So we were using this fact, right? Um, so the, this is this is one of the ways of defining the push forward, right? That by doing by doing uh, this change of variables y equals s of x, then putting the Jacobian effectively turns this density into this density row. So we have an inequality, and probably what you should be asking yourself is, you know, this holds for lots of different choices of rho and v. What you should be asking is, can we ever make this an equality, right? Uh, if we're going to really be computing this object, which is the, what we essentially want at the end of the day, we want to actually compute optimal transport, uh, then the question is, can we find rho and v that make this an equality? So this is our next question. Okay, oh, what does that look like? That looks like going through every line here where there's a less than or equal to sign and saying what would it take to actually make this an equal sign? What would it take to make this one here an equal sign? Right? And if we can do that, then we can achieve equality. Okay, so let's see what we need. We certainly need So we need, this inequality came from the fact that uh, capital X was feasible but not necessarily optimal. If this was the optimal map, we'd have equality here, right? So we need that capital one X is equal to T of X, which we'll call the optimal map. The optimal map from F to G. <clears throat> so if we can make that true, we get an equal sign here. Um, and the other place that we need to worry about is can we make this integral squared equal to this integral here? Uh, so I'll let you look at that and, and tell me what it would take to do that. choice of dx by dt would give that to us. If it's constant? If it's constant, yeah. There's no, there's no reason to go complicated here. Let's go simple. If dx by dt is constant as a, as a function of time, then we get equality there. So if this holds, if, if we can write this, Okay, if this is constant in time. 
Okay, so getting equality through here really means um, placing a couple extra conditions on these Lagrange coordinates. Um, we know that they move in a constant way as far as time is concerned, um, and we know where they have to end up, and, and but we also knew where they had to start, right? We knew at time zero we should just recover x here. So this is just something to recall that at time zero we should get x. Okay, so uh, and now we're pretty much in business, right? We just want something whose derivative is constant. Um, that's easy to do, and obviously, right, so we get something linear, and something on the form, you know, at plus b, and then we have two conditions at our initial and final time. So something like this would work. And we have the condition that x plus e of x is equal to t of x. Right? If t equals 0, we get little x. Uh, at t equals 1, we want to get it. capital T. And the derivative of this is just q. So this will do what we want. Okay, so at the end of the day, what do we have? We have u of x is t of x minus x, and capital X is x plus t minus x t. Or another way of writing this, x times 1 minus t plus t times t of x. By the way, do you remember seeing uh, maps like this before? The optics problem? Uh, the optics problem, maybe. Uh, I was thinking of the very center problem, actually. Uh, this would be like your log the one and log the two moving it from x to t to x. So that's not a super important comment. It's just an aside. We've actually played with this map before. OK, so we know what we want our Lagrange coordinates to do for us. Um, and the question is, can we find the velocity field B that, that makes sense of this? <coughs> so what do we need? For a velocity field, okay, it should satisfy. Okay, well, remember uh, the derivative of this, the time derivative of this, which is u of x, was equal to our velocity field, but you know, tracking at the correct point. So we should have. V T and capital X equal to U of X, which was T of X minus X. Or I'm just going to write this a little more at the operator, T minus the identity acting on X. y equal this guy. And we're trying to solve for you know, v of t y. What's it y equal? This guy. Right, which has all of this form. So this is uh, 1 minus t times times the identity 
plus t times my amount t all acting on x. acting on 1 minus ti plus tt inverse. Okay, so what does this mean? If we take this velocity field, we start with our rho equal to f of the initial time, we keep flowing it up to time 1. Um, we're going to flow f into g. And this particular pair of rho and v will actually let us achieve the optimal map from f to g. That the capital X that we get out of this will actually be the optimal map. And w2 squared will actually be equal to uh, the resulting integral that we wrote down. Okay, so this lets us achieve <coughs> okay, as long as things are nice enough that you can write down the map, um, this comes back to your question. If things are not nice enough that you can re, um, write down a map and achieve the minimum, you still can achieve an infimum, right? So, so this is necessary to actually achieve a minimum, um, but you can sort of approximate by it things that are arbitrarily close but smooth in a way that you get maps out um, and come arbitrarily close to your infima. So, so this achieves the optimum or minimum in F and G are nice. Right. Otherwise, uh, we do kind of smooth approximations. down an expression of the optimal transport cost. Um, we said it was always less than or equal to the result of integrating these flow variables. With and, we said we can achieve equality at some point for some complicated looking map. Obviously, a priori, we don't know t. Um, that's the goal of this approach is to try to find t. Um, but it means we can look at this as a minimum of that flow problem. So W2 squared F G is equal to the infimum over all rho and V satisfying our appropriate flow problem. Okay, subject two. Subject two having the correct flow. and having the correct initial and final densities. So this, this is the Van der Brenny formulation, uh, and it's, it's equivalent to solving an optimal transport problem. Um, it's, it's an alternate way of writing an optimization problem, and of course, running things in alternate ways. Um, gives you alternate tools to that at your disposal, and maybe an alternate way of coming up with the numerical method, um, and also maybe an alternate way of proving some things about the optimal map using fluid tools, for example. Uh, any questions on the formulation, first of all? So now, 
how do we actually solve this? Um, so let me write down a toy problem first of all, which has it basically has this structure. We're mi what are we doing here? We're minimizing something so to equality constraints, basically. Um, and these are. So oh, let's just write it up this form. Minimizing some f of x subject to ax equals b. That's not the exact problem that we have here, but it's kind of a toy model to start us off thinking about it. Uh, and one approach to these kind of problems is to write down a Lagrangian and try to solve a saddle point problem. Okay, so. I know some of you have seen this, some of you may have kind of not. So we could write down this Lagrangian. Let's call it L of X lambda. So we introduce this Lagrangian multiplier. And we have the beast that we're trying to minimize, plus we put in our equality. Okay, and then, uh, and I'll try to argue why this makes sense. We're going to see the saddle points of this. So in other words, we're going to solve this problem. We want to minimize over all x, f of x. Obviously, we're trying to minimize f plus the supremum over all lambda of lambda dot ax minus b. We get the same KKT conditions, sure. Different, you know, there's different formulations just to inspire different types of methods, basically. Oh, and it turns out when we write down the Lagrangian for this problem, if we do it right, and the Benjamin and Brady did it in a clever way, where they were able to write down a very simple numerical method. Uh, as simple as good. Um, so here, right, um, you know, this object here it is basically unbounded. And lambda, unless unless we're multiplying by zero here. Ah, so the fact that we're trying to achieve a, a minimum overall uh, will force us to either have a z you know we're going to be forced to either have a zero here or an infinity here by taking the supremum. Since we want the minimum, this is going to force us to achieve this equality constraint. Okay, so this is a reasonable thing to do. Um, of course, you can pull the soup out in front. Now we want to write down, <coughs> similarly, a Lagrangian for this type of problem. Okay, so let's try to do the same thing. Okay, for our flow problem. Uh, I'm going to, for technical reasons that are not that important, really, but, uh, but it's the way they did it. Uh, I'm going to put a half here and a half here, right, which obviously changes nothing. Oh, but just to be aware that that's where that extra factor of a half is going to come in. I'm, I'm not speaking in fudge factors to try to make the math work. All right, so let's let phi be the Lagrange multiplier. Okay, so phi has to multiply all of this at all points in time and space. So phi is a function. Like here, lambda was a vector. Now phi is a function of time and space. <coughs> okay, and now let's look at multiplying it by this continuity equation. Uh, and we're going to do what we often do is we integrate so that we can do some integration by parts, right? And come up with a weak interpretation of this, a weak formulation of this. Okay, so 
the continuity equation, which is basically our equality constraint, will give us this kind of term. Okay, so if someone's you know, here, they're doing an inner product between the Lagrange multiplier and the equality constraint. And so they're doing an, uh, doing an inner product means integrating. So we're going to get rho t plus the divergence of rho v times v. Okay, uh, we do integration by parts. Uh, so we know that when we do integration by parts here in, in time, that's going to cause the initial and final conditions to pop out. Okay, so we're going to get an integral over Rn of, okay, um, rho at the final time, uh, which is g, times b at the final time. Okay, minus the same thing at the initial time. So initial density was f. Um, when I do integration by parts in space, there's no boundary terms um, because I have compactly supported densities. Okay, so what's left? Well, I've moved a time derivative uh, onto V, and I'm going to move a divergence onto V. It becomes a gradient of V. Okay, so what does this do? This builds in our initial and final conditions that we want to satisfy, uh, and it builds in the continuity equation interpreted in a weak sense. Okay, so for our Lagrangian, uh, we need that, right? This is the term that comes from our Lagrange multiplier, from our equality constraints. Uh, and then we need the beast that we're actually trying to minimize, which is this object. Okay, so our Lagrangian becomes L is integral over time and space of the object that we're trying to minimize, so that's rho v squared over 2. Uh, this is where the factor of 2 comes in because I'm looking at half uh, Wasserstein. Uh, these terms. And plus, plus these boundary terms in time. So this part here it makes this again the, uh, the Lagrange multiplier with with the kind of primal variables that we care about the rho and the v. Uh, this guy here really only depends on the Lagrange multiplier. I'm gonna we're not really gonna have to do anything fancy with this. So I'm just to keep from having to write it. I'm gonna give it a name. This is something that depends on v only. Okay, so this is our Lagrangian. We want to try to solve a style point with this Lagrangian. Um, they did an extra change of variables here, which it turns out this will give us more structure that we're going to see in a, in a minute. It's a little easier to work with. It leads to the nice numerical method. Uh, and introduced, I guess you could think of it as a momentum term or something, row time v instead. So this, which will be useful in a second, uh, but it's just Certainly, a very natural substitution to do here. Okay, 
So letting m equal rho v, what do we get? We get a Lagrangian that depends on our multiplier, our density and momentum. Okay, so uh, eliminating the v from here, we're going to get an m squared over 2 rho. Minus rho vt minus uh, m dotted with rad v plus this part that depends only on the Lagrange multiplier. <coughs> okay, and then we want to use this to solve exactly the same kind of uh, solid point problem that we have here. The same kind of reasoning that, you know, we know that we're trying to minimize this over our primal variables, our um, m and our rho, and then we're going to try to maximize it over our Lagrange multiplier. So this is our saddle point problem. Okay, so in phenom over rho and m, and supremum over phi of this Lagrangian. Okay, so far? Yes? Okay. So most of this has a pretty simple form. You know, these terms, these terms are linear here that I didn't write down. So these are kind of bilinear. Bilinear. This is the only complicated term. Um, this is complicated, um, but it is convex. It is convex in both M and Rho. So we want to try to use a trick that we've actually used before is to say we have some object that we're trying to minimize. It's convex, but the format of it is complicated. Um, but what do we know about convex objects? And we've done this before. We can write it as the supremum of a bunch of affine objects. Right? And we did this, oh, when did we do this? We did this when we were doing semi-discrete optimal transport. And and by writing it in that way, we could pull out a whole lot more structure. Uh, and, and in this case, we'll actually be able to write down a very simple numerical method when we do that. So, so this is what we want. We want to try to take that complicated term and write it in terms of some kind of linear terms. And then, and then throughout here, we're basically linear, you know, by linear all the way through. And, and that starts to look simpler to work with. So this is my claim. Let's let each of rho and m be this complicated term. And my claim is that this can indeed uh, be written as the supremum of a bunch of uh, linear terms. Right, which we expect if things come back, so we expect that's the case. So the supremum over some feasible set, which I'll write down in a minute, of something linear in rho and linear in m. <coughs> okay, again, the, this, the fact that we can do this for an appropriate case shouldn't be surprising, right? Because it's convex. We can write it in terms of supporting hyperplanes. This is the maximum of a bunch of supporting hyperplanes. Um, and here, the appropriate choice of set K here is the set of AB on to, let's see, so the scalar value. This is B dot M, I guess. I 
I such that a plus b squared over 2 is less than or equal to 0. Certainly maximize, right? There's no trick to trying to maximize this. Um, if this is this is concave, we want to maximize it, we just need to take the gradient and set it equal to zero and then and, and it's maximized. And so since this is concave, it means we just need to set the gradient to zero. Okay, so what do we get? We get minus rho b plus m equals zero. Okay, so what do we want? We want b star equal to m over rho. <coughs> to, and we put this value of b star in here, so we get minus m squared over 2 rho plus this dot m is m squared over rho. Which is m squared over 2 rho, which is exactly the h that we wrote down. the 
big point of that, the big point of that was that I could write this term, which was the really nonlinear term in my function, and I could write it in terms of a whole bunch of uh, linear objects. And linear is good. Linear is simple. Okay, so let's rewrite our style point problem a little bit. Okay, so my style point problem becomes <clears throat> okay, again, it was the infimum overall rho and m, the supremum overall c. <clears throat> uh, and now we have another term that comes up in our supremum, I guess, because we're rewriting this first term in terms of a and b. So we have the supremum overall c and also overall a and b. Of well, we had the first term became a rho plus b dot m. Okay, and then everything else should stay the same here. So minus rho b t minus m dot grad v plus this extra term that depended on the Lagrange multiplier. <coughs> uh, and again, I, I want to try to boil down just sort of the core structure of this problem. <coughs> so let me start by uh, collecting some of the terms involved rho, right? Some of the terms involved m. Symmetric final variables. Uh, so let's just collect those a little bit. <coughs> okay, so I have terms that involve rho. So collect those. What do I have? A minus Bt. And B minus Okay, again, I'm trying to boil down the core structure here. Uh, so my, my unknowns are already uh, a vector value function, right? Because uh, m is vector valued. So I'm just going to build these into a, this is a three vector vector, depending on what dimension we're in. Um, I'm just going to build these into an n plus one vector of my unknown primal variables. So let's let r equal rho and m. So those are my unknowns. A vector. <coughs> I need the objects, um, the coefficients of them. So what are the coefficients of them? Well, I have an a and b. So let's let let's pack those into a vector. So I'll call c. <coughs> and then what else do I have? I have a b t and a grad c. So I pack those into a, into a big vector. It really just looks like a space-time gradient. So I'm going to denote it like this. Phi tx grad of phi tx of phi is going to be phi t and then grad phi. So the space-time gradient. Okay, so what is our saddle point problem? Our saddle point problem is infimum over our primal variables, that's R, the supremum over our Lagrange multiplier, and uh, these extra coefficients, which we now lumped together as C. And now I have basically an inner product um, here. 
I have okay, my C variables minus my space time gradient dotted with my primal variables. Okay, so I can write that in kind of compact notation, right? C minus my space time gradient dotted with R plus this extra G of V. that we want to solve, something that at its core has this structure. Is that okay? Alright, so now let's try to write down a numerical method for solving a problem that has this structure. Um, so the first thing that they did is to say, let's try to regularize this maximum a little bit. Uh, so you know, everything here is really linear. Um, so let's add a small quadratic regularization term. Uh, so let's uh, let tau be some small parameter and regularize the maximum a bit. one extra little term, uh, which we'll see is going to lead to a very simple method. Okay, so we have C minus a space-time gradient dotted with R plus G of C minus a little quadratic term. So I, what I'm doing here is regularizing um, the maximum, so I want minus my quadratic term. We want, we want concavity. So minus tau over 2 times the norm of C minus the space time gradient squared. <coughs> so the algorithm is really does Maybe the simplest thing that you can think to do is to say there's kind of a lot of unknowns in here. There's, you know, even in this compact form, there's sort of three unknowns that I have to come up with. And trying to optimize three things uh, at the same time seems hard. So let's, so let's not. Let's sort of freeze two of them and optimize one. And then freeze two different ones and optimize another. Freeze two different ones and optimize another, and, and rotate and iterate like this. Right. So we optimize over this. We optimize over this. We optimize over this. Now, of course, every time we optimize over one, we break the optimal for the other one. So we have to iterate. Uh, but it turns it into a very simple problem. You know, what do we have at worst? We have quadratic terms at worst. You're probably not unhappy to see that is it's your nastiest object to an optimization problem. So let's try to actually do this optimization. We're going to optimize <coughs> these three unknowns independently. Okay, so first of all, I suppose I'm given uh, RK and CK, and we want to find the optimal speed. All right, so what do we have? We have phi k plus 1 is the arc mass over all phi of, uh, well, c dot r, that, that doesn't that's just a constant, so we don't really need to worry about that. Um, we have a minus the space time gradient dotted with r plus g of phi 
minus something that's quadratic in the B. So this, this is an unconstrained quadratic optimization problem. Um, so when you see a quadratic optimization problem, unconstrained, uh, what, what would you do to solve it? Take the gradient, sure, right? So there's, there's, no, there's nothing complicated here. So since this is quadratic uh, and unconstrained, when we take the gradient and set it to zero, what are we going to get? We're going to get a linear problem. Is, does not phi itself, it's a gradient of phi, space time gradient of phi. So when you go ahead and compute the, the first variation of this, right? so I said gradient to zero, you know, we're, we're integrating this space time gradient. We compute the first variation that's at equal to zero, we're going to get something that looks like a Laplacian of phi popping up. Well, and it's, it's kind of unique, it's a space time Laplacian. So somehow in this formulation, time, time acts like space. Time, yeah, time becomes, time becomes another dimension of space. And you kind of see that throughout, you know, instead of having initial conditions here, we had initial and final condition all the way through. But time was somehow, you know, we had boundary conditions in time. So time is really acting like space in this formulation. So computing the first variation, we get basically just a Poisson equation we have to solve. with Neumann boundary conditions. Right. These are going to be homogeneous uh, in space and non-homogeneous in time uh, because the, the, we had this boundary value problem in time. Our initial and final densities are set. And so we're basically solving something like this. The space time Laplacian of phi is equal to some fixed right hand side. <coughs> um, so that's not bad. You can solve this, say, in order and log n time. Um, with the caveat, again, it's a space-time Laplacian. So you're, you're discretizing an extra dimension. And this is where this formulation is, is not as cheap. This is a robust formulation, but it's not as cheap because you've added this extra dimension to the problem. And it's not just you know, iterating through time. Time is acting like a space dimension here. Okay, but this, this is easy. We can do this in order and log in. Now we say, okay, that's updated. Now let's try to update another variable. So let's optimize for optimize for C. Okay, so again, we're trying to maximize uh, this object over all uh, C. Uh, what do we have? C dotted with R, and then minus a quadratic term. Okay, so what happens here? Again, this is quadratic optimization. This is simpler than the last time. The last time what we had sitting here was a gradient of phi. Now we just have to see itself, right? No gradients which means we can do this point-wise. What happens at one position in space 
uh, is basically independent of what happens at uh, another position in space. So at each position in string in space, I can optimize C times R, C dotted with R, or minus of this term, right? And, and if, I, if I maximize that at every point in space, then I've maximized the value of when I actually integrate all of this. So this, since there are no gradients, we do this point-wise. Again, it's just quadratic optimization. So at each point, it's just a couple quick computations to update C. There's nothing complicated that has to be done. Oh, C is, you know, you can really think of as optimizing a function of one variable. So that's easy. That's order n cost. I can't decide if you look like you believe me or you don't believe me. Uh, no, I believe you on that. I was looking at the next part. Okay. So how are we going to optimize the next part? This isn't quadratic anymore. Um, so then what we did finally is, okay, again, we've been given uh, bk plus one and c plus k plus one. And then they said, let's just do gradient descent in R. And take a gradient descent step in R. Um, so, so we're not going to get the full optimum in one iteration, but we're heading towards the optimum. And with each iteration, we're going to, you know, Correct, correct B, correct C, take another gradient descent step in R. Correct B, correct C, take another gradient descent. So let's do gradient descent in R. So what do we get? We get Rk plus 1 equals Rk minus tau times, and now we have to look at the gradient in R. Okay, the gradient in R is going to be this object here. Tau times C K plus one minus the space time gradient of A. <coughs> and of course then we iterate. Does the order in which you optimize over the variables matter? Does the order in which you optimize over the variables matter? I don't think it really does. Okay. Um, so it's a very simple algorithm, right? You start with a hard problem and potentially very difficult data. Uh, but maybe maybe your target density is about a convex set and maybe maybe zero in some places. And, you know, you may have low regularity solutions. You can implement this. Uh, and it's very easy. Again, it's not the cheapest thing because we've got this extra, this extra variable, this extra dimension effectively, um, but it is very robust. So this, this was also one of, the, one of the earlier methods for optimal transport that was introduced. 